Hey there, how's everyone doing? Um, I'm here to start our next section of Bio 101 and this is probably my favorite section and um, you know traditionally when I've, I've uh, polled students after this class this has uh, been one of the, the favorite sections of the students as well so I hope you enjoy it. But we're going to start talking about evolution and um, uh, of course if we're going to talk about evolution we're going to talk about Charles Darwin and so we like to put this into a historical context um, it helps to understand the development of the idea to kind of understand when it developed and and it, it's been uh, over 150 years ago uh, middle uh, 19th century 1859 is when Darwin published on the origin of species by means of natural selection and um, you know this is a an idea that caught on very quickly and and it's a very important idea in biology Darwin made two main points in his book. One, that species show evidence of descent with modification from common ancestors. So all life has descended from earlier life. Um, and there's uh, evidence that we can see if we study these different organisms. And his second main point was that natural selection was the mechanism behind this descent with modification. So those are the two broad ideas that we're going to introduce and we're going to talk more about in this lecture. It's important to understand that, that evolution and natural selection are you know, different ideas, right? Evolution is the idea that all organisms arose from a common ancestor and all organisms have descended from that ancestor um, and, and been modified over time. Natural selection is the, the most important mechanism for causing those changes over time. And so as we talk about these, hopefully those ideas will solidify a little better. Classic example that I'm going to keep coming back to is very simple. You've got a population of bugs here. So you see on the far left, you've got these bugs and they vary in some trait. And so natural selection always starts with variation in the population. Now, in frame two here, you've got elimination of individuals with certain traits. And so you've got the bird coming in and it's eating these bugs, but it's not eating them at random. It's more likely to see the ones that are brightly colored. It's more likely to grab those and to eliminate them. In frame three, you see reproduction of the survivors. Those that don't get eaten are more likely to reproduce and they're going to pass on their traits. And so the ones that are less likely to get eaten are the darker bugs, and they're the ones that are more likely to reproduce. And so then in, in, in frame four, the increasing frequency of traits that enhance survival and reproduction. And so over time, on average, the bugs get darker because of this dark background that they live on, because of their environment. And that's the basic idea behind evolution by natural selection. The uh, later bugs descended from the earlier bugs, but they were slightly modified in that, on average, the population got darker. And with a lot of big ideas, they're pretty simple. And this is a pretty simple idea. And if you think about it, it makes perfect sense. But a lot of big ideas are like that. Like whenever somebody finally points them out, everybody goes, oh, yeah, why didn't I think of that? And it's kind of the same way. You know, when Darwin pointed this out, everyone's like, Oh yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And when you go out and study biology, you see, oh yeah, we see this all the time. It makes a lot of sense. And so natural selection results in the adaptation of organisms to their environment. So in this example, the bugs became better adapted to their environment because those that were less well adapted were eliminated. Those that were better adapted reproduced and their, their traits stuck around. And that's the simple idea that is natural selection. And so that's an introduction to what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about uh, evolution and natural selection. Um, and there's a quote that everybody always uses when they talk about evolution, and I like it, by Theodosius Dobzhansky, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. And so one of the things we want to talk about first is why do we talk about evolution so much? It's not an evolution class. Well, it's a biology class. And everything in biology 
is influenced by evolution. Like he says, nothing makes sense except in light of evolution. It's not some minor idea that we can sort of skip over and not, you know, and be able to learn about biology. It is central to all biology, whether you're studying bacteria or trees or whatever. So it's a very important idea. Um, so let's, uh, let's start with another example of evolution. Um, this is a modern day example of evolution. We have lots of antibiotics that we use these days that are designed to kill bacteria, sterilize things. And, you know, you often get antibiotics when you're sick because if the doctor thinks you've got a bacterial infection, the antibiotics will help kill the bacteria in you and make you better. But we use them much more than just when you're sick. We do a lot of prophylactic treatment, meaning we use these antibiotics in our food supply and our soaps and, and we apply them to keep bacterial levels low so that the bacteria never become a problem. So there's a major use of antibiotics in our in our world today. Now, of course, bacteria, there's a gazillion of them, right? Bacteria reproduce like crazy and they're small. And so most of those bacteria can be killed by antibiotics. That's why they work, is they kill bacteria. And, and you know, a huge percentage of the bacteria that are out there do get killed, which is what we want. But every once in a while, you've got some DNA that have a mutation that gives them some unique, some bacteria that have a mutation that gives them some unique DNA. And there's something about that DNA that helps make them resistant to the antibiotics. There are some bacteria out there that are resistant. Where did this unique D DNA come from? Well, I mean, it's what we talked about earlier. It comes from a mutation, right? There's a mutation in the DNA that changed the RNA, that changed some protein that, for whatever reason, makes the bacteria resistant to the antibiotics. And we see this. And so if we use antibiotics a lot, which we do, what happens to susceptible bacteria? The ones that are not resistant. Well, of course, they die, right? That's the whole point of the antibiotics. So those that are easily killed by antibiotics do get killed by antibiotics. And their DNA does not get passed on. They don't have any offspring. But those few that are out there that are resistant to the antibiotics, they don't get killed, do they? And now they live in a world where they don't have any competition because we've killed off all their competitors. So those that do have genetic resistance live and they pass on that resistance to their offspring. And so the proportion of resistant bacteria that's out there increases. And so you get lots of antibiotic resistance in bacteria. And this is something that is a, a serious problem that we're concerned with today is that there are many strains of bacteria now that aren't killed by traditional antibiotics. Um, and this is a big problem in places like, you know, hospitals where you use lots of antibiotics and you try to be sterile, um, but you're just, you select for these bacteria that are resistant. Well, that's a simple, common, well-documented example of evolution by natural selection. So we have to make sure that we understand exactly what's going on as this population evolves. So a lot of people say, well, well, when they first learn about evolution, will say, you know, the bacteria created their own resistance. They sensed that there was an antibiotic in the environment and they became resistant. That's not how it works, okay? Some are born with resistance. Individuals don't evolve. So the bacteria don't sense oh, there's antibiotics, I need to become resistant. It doesn't work that way. Either you're resistant or you're not resistant. If you are resistant, then you've got a better chance of surviving and reproducing. It doesn't guarantee you're gonna survive and reproduce, but you've got a much better chance because you're not gonna get killed by this antibiotic. But if you reproduce, your offspring will also have that resistance. And so that's how you can get more and more resistant bacteria. And so the result is populations of bacteria that can't be killed with traditional antibiotics. And, and this is 
uh, uh, something that we all have to deal with. And so, again, the individual bacteria in their lifetime didn't change in such a way to become resistant. Some of them were just born resistant. But the proportion of resistant bacteria was low early on. That's why when we use these antibiotics, they seem, you know, they work. They kill most of the bacteria. But you're killing the susceptible bacteria. Those that are resistant stick around so their proportion gets up. The population changes. That Those resistant bacteria descended from earlier ones, but they're modified in that they're resistant. That's descent with modification. Today's resistant bacteria descended from earlier bacteria, meaning uh, all living things come from other living things, right? All living things descend from their ancestors. The resistant bacteria that we see today descended from earlier bacteria, but they're modified. They had a mutation that caused them to have an advantage and they're resistant to antibiotics. That's descent with modification. That's evolution. And again, an individual bacterium did not evolve resistance. It was either born resistant or not resistant. But the population did evolve. If individuals don't evolve, populations evolve. The population changed. On average, the bacteria became more resistant. The proportion of resistant bacteria got higher in this population. That's how evolution by natural selection works. Now we need to worry about, a, a, again, definition. This is a term we're going to see a lot, population, and I don't know if we've defined this yet. But population is a group of individuals of the same species that interact and share a common gene pool. Okay, so if you think, you know, it's akin to the population of a city, right? The, the population of, of Murray, Kentucky, the population of Paducah, Kentucky. These are all, we're talking about humans, the same species, and they all interact in the same area and kind of same the, the common gene pool. Now, humans are, you know, much more mobile than that. But in general, that's the idea, is that when you look at a species, you have groups that tend to be, you know, to stick together and interact more than they do with other groups, and that's a population. And that's the important thing, the important unit of evolution. Populations evolve, individuals do not. And so there's another example from your book. And so if you look at figure 10.1, uh, read this description in your book, and it just gives you another example of this concept. You've got head lice. A common way to treat head lice is with shampoos that have a, a permethrin, which is a type of insecticide. And it works because it kills most of the lice. But every once in a while, you've got a louse that has a mutation that makes it resistant to the, the insecticide. And so then as, the more you use that insecticide, you're killing off the susceptible ones, but those that are resistant don't get killed off. They don't have as much competition. They reproduce and their offspring also are resistant. And so now you have populations of lice that can't be controlled by this particular insecticide. Straightforward evolution by natural selection. Okay, so that just kind of gets the ball rolling here. Um, here are the different things that I want to talk about as we go along. So this is um, sort of the order that your chapter brings them out. So um, we're going to start with the, these first bullets and then in the future lectures we're going to talk about a lot of the evidence that supports this idea of evolution by natural selection. But first, again, why do we make such a big deal about this? Because it is a big deal, okay? It unites, unites all aspects of biology. So genetics and behavior, diversity, distribution, and every single species. So again, I, I, I can't emphasize this enough. This is not just a small part of biology. You know, like you take a class in immunology, or you take a class in ecology, or you take a class in, in uh, uh, taxonomy. You know, these are all sub-disciplines, and sometimes you can take a, that class, or you can not take that class, and you can still be fine. Evolution is not like that, okay? It's not something that you can just conveniently ignore and still learn about biology. It's central to all of biology. So, some people might wonder why we as biologists we make such a big deal about this. Sometimes people don't 
aren't comfortable with us teaching evolution in schools and why can't we just ignore it or why do we have to teach it? Well, you cannot talk about biology without talking about evolution because it unites everything. So it's, it is a, we make a big deal because it is a big deal in biology. And it's the best scientific explanation for what we see in biology. Remember that this is a science class and science is trying to understand how the natural world works and it uses natural phenomena, not supernatural phenomena. And so if we want to explain what we see in biology using natural phenomena, this is the best explanation. If somebody could come up with a better one, we would reject this and use that better one. But you know, Darwin came up with this idea in 1859. People have been testing it and challenging it, and we still don't have a better scientific explanation. It, it explains a couple of really big ideas or really profound things in biology. One, it, help, it explains how come organisms are so well suited for their environment? That's an observation that Darwin made and, and many biologists, all biologists have made. That organisms seem to be well suited for their environment, but not other environments. It also explains the unity of all life. So it explains what all living things share in common, but it also explains the diversity of life. It explains why different species are different. And so this is a really, um, this is a really good theory that explains a lot of things, right? These are big ideas, and if you kind of have one idea that helps to explain all of this, that is powerful, and that's why we make a big deal out of it. So let me explain in a little bit more detail what I'm talking about here. So this mole is an organism that's well suited for its environment, right? This mole would not do well if I threw it in my pond. But underground, where it lives, in its environment, it is very well suited. Well, why is it well suited? Well, evolution by natural selection helps, gives you a good explanation, right? If it wasn't well suited for its environment, it would not stick around and pass on its alleles. Only those organisms that are well suited tend to stick around and tend to reproduce and their offspring have those same characteristics. So that's a pretty simple, good explanation of why organisms are well suited to their environment. It also explains the unity of all life. So all the things that living things have in common, right? We're all made of cells. Um, eukaryotes have organelles. All living things you know, use DNA and RNA in the same way with the same genetic code. Well, that's explained if we all come from the same common ancestor. But we also can use evolution by natural selection to explain the diversity of life. Why are different species different? So here you've got these, some orchids, right? And so you see they've got different colors and the the leaves or the petals have different shapes and they use different pollinators and they have different, you know, pHs that they need or different uh, nitrogen levels or whatever, right? So we see lots of diversity in biology and that too can be explained by evolution through natural selection. And so you've got all these ideas that all are easily explained by one idea. That's why we make a big deal out of evolution. Okay, so I've kind of talked about it, and I sort of hinted at the definition, and there's lots of ways we could define this. My favorite, the one I think works best for a class like this, is Darwin's dev uh, phrase, descent with modification. I think that captures the essence of evolution. Remember that natural selection was the mechanism that he proposed to explain how evolution occurs. So they're a little bit different, right? Evolution is this idea that all living things descend from earlier ancestors, and over time, species change and new species arise. That's evolution. What causes this change? What's the mechanism? The most important one is natural selection, and that's also the idea that Darwin came up with. And so evolution simply means that life evolved 
and appeared as smaller, simpler cells, and over time, all living things arose from this common ancestor. Um, and again, that's why all living things have, you know, share some characteristics, because we got them from our ancestors. And so this is all driven by natural methods, and all life is related. And so this is a, a, a neat cartoon that a, a guy used to work with, a colleague of mine, Matt Bonin, came up with this, and, and a lot of people use it, and it's a really neat idea. And it sort of contrasts the common idea of evolution with what biologists think of when we think of evolution. And um, the first idea that we're trying to talk about with this graphic here is this idea that, that organisms evolve into other organisms. And so a lot of people like to say, you know, humans uh, uh, evolved from chimps. And, and that's a, you know, hard for people to believe that we evolved from chimps. But that's not how biologists talk about. Biologists, we don't say that we evolved from chimps. We have a common ancestor with chimps. And this idea of evolution is that all living things have a common ancestor if you go back far enough. So let's take a look at this here. So what we're looking at on the left here is your family tree. And this is something that you are familiar with, right? And so if you look at the top part of this graphic, what we're saying is, you know, this is not your family tree, right? Your great grandfather did not morph into your grandfather, which, you know, changed into your father, which changed into you, right? You didn't come, you know, your, your father didn't turn into you. Your parents didn't turn into you, right? That's, that's sounds silly because it is silly. We don't think like that, but the bottom part is what we understand. That's what a family tree is right is that you've got relatives and you they're your relatives because you have a common ancestor break that word down an ancestor in common an ancestor is someone who came before you but you and this other person have the same have this ancestor in common it's that you descended from the same person and so you and your siblings your brothers and sisters have a common ancestor your parents. You all descended from those parents. If you think about your cousins, you also have a common ancestor with your cousin, but it goes back farther. That common ancestor goes back farther. You're related to your cousins through your grandparents, right? Your grandparents didn't turn into you. They didn't turn into your cousins, but they had offspring. And so this is the concept of common ancestry. And if you think about your family tree, it makes a lot of sense to you. And so you have a common ancestor with your siblings. Now, um, when we talk about sharing traits, you can also relate sharing traits to your common ancestor, right? Where do you get your traits from? Your eye color, your hair color, your, your, the shape of your face, the, all these things that make you you, where did they come from? Of course, they came from your parents. And if you have siblings, you have a lot of the same traits, right? You look the same and, and you can, most of the times you can look at someone and tell that they're related. That's because you got those traits from your common ancestor, right? And if you look at your, compare yourself to your cousins, you might seem somewhat familiar, but you don't look as much like your cousins as you do your siblings. That's because, you got your traits from a more distant common ancestor. And so if you think about your family tree, you have common ancestors with your siblings, common ancestors with your cousins, common ancestors with your second cousins, if you go back far enough in time. Well, if you extend this idea way far back in time, you can start to see common ancestors not among your siblings and your cousins, but common ancestors among species. And so now we're not talking you know, 50 years, 100 years, 200 years. We're talking 50,000 years, 200,000 years, 200 million years, a billion years, 2 billion years, an unimaginably long time, but that's what the evidence shows. And so 
when we talk about evolution, at the top of this right hand of the graph, you know, a fish did not evolve into a salamander, into a cat, into a, a human. Human, you know, chimps did not evolve into humans, but we have a common ancestor. And so if we trace our species back far enough, we can see that there's a common ancestor somewhere that lived in Africa that whose offspring evolved into chimps and other offspring evolved into humans. And this common ancestor, you would have recognized them. They would have had chimp-like features, maybe human-like features, but they would not have been either a chimp or a human. And, uh, and you know, we, there's a million details we could go into about human evolution, but we do that in the evolution class and anthropology and things like that. But if you go back even further, you can find, hey, there's a common ancestor between humans and other mammals. There's a common ancestor between mammals and amphibians and so on. So it's just taking that family tree idea, which you're comfortable with, you know, working back your family tree to see who your common ancestors are, but just keep going and keep going a really long time and you start to find common ancestry with other species. That's the biologist idea of evolution. Okay, so here's a figure from your book and it's kind of trying to show you the same idea in a different way again. This is a, like what we call a cladogram. And so if you, you know, this is just the change in, in organisms and species over time. And so if you go from left to right, uh, the time passes in thousands of generations, right? Very long period of time. On the right, the tips of these branches represent uh, modern day organisms. So if you look around and you see species, those would be at the tips of these organisms. And what this is showing you is that if you could take modern organisms and if you walk back many, many, many generations, you can find the common ancestor of these species. Just like if I take uh, you and your cousins, I can walk back just a couple generations and I can find that common ancestor. But, you know, you can do 23 and me and you can I could take you and and somebody else in Kentucky and we can walk back a few more generations and oh this is our common ancestor and I could take you and, and President Trump and I can walk you back and and eventually find some common ancestor well if we just keep doing that we can do that with species we can take modern species and walk them back and find that common ancestor and so that's what this again that's the biologist idea of evolution. And so you can see if you follow these branches and, and these nodes, you can see that some of them branch off and, and form new species, but then they stop, right? Lots of species used to exist, but then they went extinct a long time ago. Of course, we get this from the fossil record. And you can see that other groups didn't go extinct. They stuck around and they branched. And some of those branches ultimately went extinct. But other branches stuck around and branched. And ultimately that leads to the diversity of life that we see today. Okay, so let's talk about some early ideas about species and about evolution. Um, with these big ideas in science, it helps to sometimes understand and know the history behind them and how they um, developed. It helps you understand them a little bit better. So let's do that. So Darwin and the Darwinian revolution challenged these traditional ideas that the earth is young and that species don't change. And so this was an idea that was, you know, common um, for thousands of years. Going back to Aristotle, um, biologists thought species don't change. What you see now is how things have always been. Um, but up until Darwin, that was sort of the idea, but Darwin really challenged that. And one of the reasons that Darwin's idea uh, took off is because at the same time in the 1800s is when people really started to collect and notice fossils. And the fossil record really suggests otherwise, that species do change over time. And so we'll talk about fossils in a little bit more detail in future lectures, but in general, fossils are really important to this idea. What are they? They're just remains of earlier organisms, right? They're most often found in sedimentary rock, which appears in layers or strata. 
And so as sediment gets carried by water, it eventually settles out and then new sediment settles on top and new sediment settles on top and you make these strata or layers. And so the deeper you go, the deeper strata are older. And so fossils that are found in those strata are also older. And so as you start to study these fossils and their relationship and, and where they're found and how deep they are and starting to age them, you start to put together this fossil record that really suggests, no, um, the species we see today are very different than what used to exist. And there used to be lots of very different species and, and um, species have changed over time. And so again, this is just showing that, that sediment being deposited in layers and the deeper the layer, the older the rock, but also the older the fossils that are found within that rock. And so you can not only look at remnants of these early organisms, but you can relate them in time. And so this is all part of the rock cycle. And so if you study evolution, you know, you really get into geology a lot. And Darwin's really into geology and it really helps to understand you know the earth and the age of the earth and the processes that form these fossils but basically again you start at the top of this cycle you've got weathering and erosion right you've got rain that falls and dislodges sediment particles that get carried downstream and eventually deposited and then just they just keep getting buried deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper and so the heat goes up and the pressure goes up as you bury that sediment and that sedimentary rock and then eventually it starts to get compressed and starts to liquefy and starts to get pushed up and you've got things like plate tectonics and and you have plates smashing together and, and volcanoes erupting and that rock being brought back up to the surface to form new mountains where the cycle starts over again and so that's a, a very large scale long time scale process that helps to explain the history of the earth and that's very important to understanding uh, formation of this rock and understanding the fossils that are found in these rocks. So those fossils suggest that species do change over time. In fact, more species have existed and gone extinct than are currently on Earth right now. So our evolutionary history, as seen in the fossils, is very different than what you see now. And so this is one of those things that Darwin's trying to explain. And so with Darwin, and as people began to study fossils more and started to, to understand geology more, you started to have some changing ideas about species. And first off, if you talk about geology, geologists began to realize that the Earth is very, very old. Not a few thousand years old, but a few billion years old, which is kind of an incomprehensible amount of time and began to realize that small effects over a long time can end up having, can, can then turn into big effects. Small things, small changes over a long time can lead to big changes. So for example, here's the Grand Canyon, right? Did the Grand Canyon form by a comet hitting? Did the Grand Canyon form by an earthquake, you know, or a very quick violent process? No. It formed by the slow erosion over a long, long, long time. And this is a perfect example of how if you have a small change but a long time, it ends up being a big change. And so it starts to make you think about the age of the Earth and how things can change over long periods of time. Now there's lots we could talk about as far as the development of the idea of species, but we're just going to hit the ones that are in your book and hit some highlights. And one person that we talk about a lot that came a little before Darwin was Lamarck. And Lamarck was also convinced that slow, gradual change can create new species. And so he's trying to explain the fossil record. He's trying to explain this idea that species we see today are very different than what we used to see and, and species can change over time and we get new species and other species go extinct. And how that can happen through slow, gradual change, not violent, quick change. And so his hypothesis was this idea of acquired characteristics, that species use some characters and some body parts and don't use others, 
and they acquire changes in their body that they then pass on to their offspring and over time you can see a change in a species and so classic example or a way to explain Lamarck's way of thinking is to look at giraffes and so we're looking at the change in giraffes over time the giraffes originally had shorter necks but of course now they have very long necks and so Lamarck would have said look the early giraffes all had short necks which we know we can see that in the fossil record but to survive they needed to stretch you know the food is getting scarce and they eat the leaves and so they need to stretch their short neck and their whole life they're stretching and stretching and really reaching for those higher leaves which gives them a longer neck their necks a little bit longer from a lifetime of stretching and then when they have babies their babies are born with a little bit longer neck and then the those offspring have to stretch and stretch and stretch and over their lifetime their neck gets a little bit longer and then their babies are born with a longer neck and so on and so on and so they acquired this longer neck you know in over their lifetime they stretched and made their neck longer and then passed that on to their offspring this is Lamarck's idea of how species can change gradually over time and so Lamarck thought that animals or species and I say animals here but we're talking about any species change during their lifetime and the changes were then passed on to their offspring and so this is his explanation for hey this is how you can have a gradual change that leads to very different species and very different traits there's a problem in that biology doesn't really work that way okay so look at this tree here and so this is a bonsai tree and this gentleman is trimming it and creating a very unique shape and so this tree is acquiring this new shape now if you took seeds from this tree and planted them would you expect those plants to have this shape no right it acquired that shape but it, it's not going to pass that shape on this dude you know this dude was not born this way he acquired these muscles and he acquired this tan skin if he had a kid would you expect the kid to be born pumped up with really tan skin no he acquired those traits but he's not going to pass those traits on another question how many of you have a tattoo again we're not in class but if you have a tattoo and then if you have a kid do you expect your kid to have your tattoo in the exact same spot of course not right you acquired this change but you're not going to pass that change on and that's because these acquired characteristics are not genetic and so that's where Lamarck was wrong he was right that species can change gradually over time but he had the wrong mechanism because these acquired characteristics aren't genetic and don't get passed on and so here's again an example from your book kind of similar to my earlier example there's Arnold Schwarzenegger who's got this acquired muscle body and then on the right's his son right and his son was not born and does not have the same muscles because that you know those big muscles that Arnold has are not uh, genetic they're acquired right there are genetic characteristics that Arnold has that he did pass on to his son but not those great big muscles and so that's the problem with Lamarck's hypothesis and so this is what Darwin studied and was thinking about and he said no I think I've got a better explanation for how species can change gradually over time and so again we can talk about Darwin a lot and understanding where he came up with these ideas is important to understanding those ideas and um, basically we always start with the voyage of the Beagle and so this was a ship that sailed from England sailed around the world for about five years and Darwin was invited to, to sail along on, on this ship and um, so as he did he was um, he was very into naturalism he was very into collecting you know he was supposed to I think he's supposed to be a, a clergyman and he didn't like that and then he's supposed to go to med school and he didn't like that but he really dug being a naturalist and studying 
nature and collecting specimens. And so as he went around the world on the Beagle, he visited lots of places, um, collected lots of specimens. And he read a lot of books and had a lot of time to think. And so this is kind of how these ideas developed. And so here's a figure kind of showing the route that they took, uh, spent a lot of time around South America, and then came back around Africa and long survey. And this is when Darwin was in his early 20s. So right about the same age as, as many of, of you students, um, he left on this voyage and, and did all this collecting and thinking. And so he saw all kinds of things that he probably would have never seen in England. He experienced an earthquake and saw how rocks could be lifted, you know, and made him start thinking about large geologic processes. He found fossils of sea creatures on mountaintops. That seems weird. How do you explain that? How do you explain a sea creature way up on top of this mountain? Um, and the most famous thing that's associated with Darwin is, is the Galapagos Islands. They stopped and studied the Galapagos Islands. Okay, so here's the shows where the Galapagos Islands are. Um, kind of at the equator just off South America. This was a common place for, for European ships to stop and, and take on provisions and take on water and, and that sort of thing. And so it's logical that they stopped there, but they were there for a while and Darwin studied these islands. And he's looking at a lot of the species on these islands and the islands themselves. And he hypothesized that the species from South America had colonized the Galapagos. That's how those species, that's how those organisms got there. And then once they got to the islands, they speciated and changed a little bit. And so if you look, uh, you know, we zoom in on the islands and there's there's several islands and they're different sizes and they're volcanic islands. And so they have different ages um, and they have unique environments. And so what Darwin kind of noticed was that each island's unique and the organisms on each island were unique, but they were, they were unique in a way that made them well suited to their island. And so Darwin wanted to explain that. Like, how come when I look at these organisms, they're well suited for the island that they're on, but not this one that's just across the water. It's not very far away. That's interesting. And he also noticed, because he'd been in South America collecting, he noticed that, hey, these organisms on these Galapagos Islands are very similar to organisms that I see in South America, too. And so it really makes sense that these organisms probably originally came from South America, but then they changed when they got here to the islands. And so there's lots of examples, and again, you know, we could spend all day talking about Darwin and his examples. The most famous organisms associated with them are the finches. And so each island had unique species of birds that were well adapted to that island. And these birds seemed to be related because they all looked very similar, but they really differed in their beaks. So they seemed to, they, they were the same size and, and similar characteristics, but their beaks were very different. But the beaks were different in a way that made them well suited to whatever island they were found on. It's like, that's interesting. How did that happen? And all the birds looked very similar to finches that were found on South America, but also, again, a little different. And so here's an example of what we're talking about. So here's on one island has a lot of cacti. And the finches have this, bird, this beak that's heavy and long and allows them to get in between the spines and to feed on the cactus. But here's another finch that lives on a different island. And look at its, its beak. And this, this island doesn't have cacti, but it's got a lot of insects. And this bird eats insects. And he's got a little beak that's very good. It's like a little pair of tweezers. It's very good for picking little insects, right? This beak is not good for eating on cacti, just like the other beak is not good for, for catching insects. You go to a different island. The food base is seeds. There's only a few species of plant. They produce these big, heavy seeds. The only thing to eat are seeds. And you see the finches have this great, big, heavy beak. It's like a pair of vice grips or pliers or something that's designed for crushing open these heavy seeds. Darn, so that's interesting. And so why are the species on the, each island similar to each other, but also a little different? 
and why are they different in a way that makes them well adapted to their own islands, but not nearby islands? That's kind of what he was ruminating on. But then he could extend that idea to all these other species he found in all these other environments as well. And it wasn't just the finches. Each island had its own type of giant tortoise, right? And each tortoise seemed to be well adapted to its island, but not to the other islands. And there's all kinds of other examples. And so this is what really kind of stimulated his thinking. And again, you know, he's crossing that ocean once they leave the Galapagos and he's got all these specimens and all these notes he took and he's got years to think about this. And so he kind of started to put it together. Uh, here's another example from your book. Um, prickly pear cactus, which you're familiar with, right? So if you look on the left, there's prickly pear that you're probably familiar with. You know, it lies low to the ground and that's what you find on South America. But on the Galapagos, you find a prickly pear that clearly is related to the one that's on the mainland, but it's got a trunk and it's much taller. It's a different environment, and so it's better suited to that island environment. Why? And so Darwin was familiar with Lamarck's explanation for this. He's like, no, 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 he's like, I got a better idea. And so his idea was natural selection. And so he thought that these species could change because those that were best suited to a particular island would survive and reproduce and pass their traits on to their offspring. And those that were not well suited to a particular island were less likely to survive, less likely to reproduce, and so they would die off without leaving offspring. And so what would be left behind would be the ones that are best suited. And so individuals with favorable inherited traits are more likely to survive, more likely to reproduce, and their offspring are also going to have those very traits that gave their parents an advantage. And he called this idea natural selection. And it's a very simple idea, but it makes a lot of sense. And so finches that are born poorly suited to an island, maybe their beak is not quite the right shape, or they're too small, or whatever reason, they're less likely to survive, which means they're less likely to reproduce on that island. But those that were born well suited are more likely to survive and more likely to reproduce, and their offspring will also be well suited to that island. So again, natural selection always starts with variability. You've got a bunch of finches or whatever, and they're all a little bit different. If that's true, some of them have to be a little bit better suited to the environment than the others. It's just how it works. And here again, back to our insect example. This is how it works with our insects. We start with a lot of variability. And if you're a biologist, you see that that's, you know, that's a phenomenon that's true about living things. There is lots of variability out there. And Darwin noticed this. So in our insects, there's lots of variability in color. But some of those are better at hiding than others based upon their color. And if you're better at hiding, you're less likely to get eaten by the bird. You're more likely to survive. You're going to reproduce and your offspring are also going to be well adapted to that dark color. Now, if the environment changes, now you may not be well suited. And that's another phenomenon that we see in biology. Environments change all the time, but, but what some organisms are always better suited for the current environment than other organisms. And so Darwin would explain giraffes in a different way than Lamarck. Darwin would say, no, 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 they didn't acquire that long neck. Some giraffes were born with a longer neck and others with a shorter neck. Those with a shorter neck couldn't get enough food. And so they tended to die before they reproduced. And so the only ones that tended to stick around, that tended to get enough food, that tended to reproduce were the ones that were born with a longer neck. And when they have babies, their babies have that longer neck because that longer neck is genetic. It's not an acquired trait. It's one that you were born with. And so that long neck trait gets passed on to the next generation. And then in the next generation, some are going to have a little bit longer necks than others. They're going to be born that way. Those with a little bit longer neck are more likely to survive. And over time, you can get longer and longer necks. And that's evolution by natural selection. 
Okay, so that's our introduction to evolution and natural selection. Um, of course, this is a big topic, and we could spend a lot of time talking about it, and I love talking about it. Um, but in this class, you know, we want to give you um, give you the information that you need as a non-biologist to help you understand um, this idea. Uh, this is an idea that sometimes is controversial, that sometimes people don't like us teaching evolution in class, but I, I want you to understand that there's really nothing controversial about it. It's a simple idea, and it's the best scientific explanation for what we see in biology. I also want to make sure that I'm clear that this is not just some little side idea that we can ignore. It's very important to all of biology, so that's why we make a big deal out of it. But in future um, lectures, we're going to get into more details. We're certainly going to talk about a lot of the, evolu uh, the evidence for evolution that we see out there and why we think that this is a very good scientific explanation. So, um, as always, if you've got any questions, please let me know. That's all I have for now, so I will see you later.